in church. You sang that song like you believed it. That's the way singing needs to be. Today we begin our four-part study of the book of Acts. Greatness. There's a lot of talk about greatness these days. What great restaurant did you go to this week? What great movie did you see lately? What great pitcher is still pitching in the World Series? What great deals do you know about with some cars or houses? What's a great sale for a new dress? What great advancement has there been this year in science? But sadly, very few talk about building a great church. But that's what the book of Acts is all about. And that is the title of our lesson this morning. As we go through these first eight chapters, we will be skipping some sections as we previously studied those sections in the first principles class. However, I believe that there will be a great continuity as we go through these first eight chapters. And as we go through in learning how God wants us to build a great church, I simply want you to ask yourself one question. If everyone was like me, what kind of church would this be? If everyone was like me, what kind of church would this be? Let's get our Bibles open to Acts chapter 1. We understand that the book of Acts is written by Luke. Verse 1, chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he has chosen. Well, right here, his former book, of course, would be the book of Luke. The address, he says, in my former book, Theophilus, you'll find in the book of Luke as well, it is addressed to Theophilus. Theo means God, Philo means friend, so Theophilus means friend of God. This isn't a real person, it's a literary device. And prayerfully, he's talking to all of us this morning as friends of God. Amen? He goes on, he writes, After Jesus' suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. After Jesus died, after he was buried in resurrection, he only had one theme in everything that he talked to the faithful 11 about. It was all about the kingdom of God. But they didn't really understand because we read in verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See, the apostles, even at this time, had the concept that Jesus had come to restore the physical nation of Israel. As the, quote, Messiah of the Old Testament, David, had thrown off the Philistines from the Israelites, they really believed that Jesus was going to throw off the Roman rule from the Israelites. But, of course, we understand he came to bring a spiritual kingdom. Amen? Yeah. Verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right here is the motivating vision of the church of Jesus Christ. To take the message from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that is exactly the scope of the 28 chapters of the book of Acts. This is also called the Great Commission. And if we are going to build a great church for the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, we've got to start with the Great Commission. Now, Matthew breaks it down a little bit differently. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Right. <clears throat> Here, Matthew records these words as spoken to the faithful 11, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Right here, 
here once more is the motivating vision to go to all the nations in one generation. Right here he says, guys, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them. And then after you baptize them, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So, if the Apostle Matthew would go out and he would obey this, and we know the Apostles obeyed, amen guys? He would go out and make a disciple. He would baptize that individual. And then he would teach that individual to obey everything Jesus commanded. Well, what was the last thing that Jesus commanded? To go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them and then teach them to obey everything they've commanded. And so that person that Matthew baptized would go out with the Great Commission. The Great Commission was not just for the apostles. It's for everybody that embraces the testimony that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Are you with me right here? I've got to ask you a question. If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be in obeying the Great Commission? Do you have a great discipling relationship right now? Where you are submitting before the Lord, but also human beings who are challenging your life lovingly and gently, but ever so much by the Word of God? Are you likewise continuing to reach out to others? Not only to bring them to salvation, but to mature them in Christ, to disciple them in Christ, to spend the time that it takes to change not just their heart, not just their mind, but their very character to ensure that they will inherit eternal life. If you are not about the Great Commission, then you have become a dead-end Christian. And yet God wants us all to be disciples who make disciples who make disciples, who make disciples. That is the plan of God. That is the Great Commission. Now, in understanding the Great Commission, they gave a great message. Go to Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, we find that Peter is standing up before thousands of people on the day of Pentecost. And he shares this message, beginning in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Wow! What a foreboding, challenging message. He stands up in front of thousands of people and he says, you are responsible for crucifying Jesus. How can he say that? Not all those people were even in town when Jesus was crucified. But we understand the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in that sense, we have all nailed Jesus to the cross. Now, look at what he continues to say in verse 29. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Wow, this is huge right here. Paul says, how do we know that Jesus has come to die for our sins? He says, the testimony is in his resurrection. That proves he is the Messiah. That separates Christianity from every other kind of religion there is. You know, you look in the tomb of Buddha and you find his bones. You look in the tomb of Confucius and you find his bones. You look in the tomb of Muhammad and you find his bones. You look in the tomb of even Abraham and you find his bones. But you look in the tomb of Jesus and it's empty. How important is it? It's just important. Peter, just 50 days before, was confronted by two little servant girls about being a follower of Christ and he denies the Lord so much. That the rooster crows and he's reminded that Jesus had predicted his cursing. 
Now, just 50 days later, what's changed? It's not two little servant girls he's being confronted with. It's thousands of people in the same city. And he's just not up there giving him a rah-rah message. He says, you have crucified Jesus. What has changed? Peter now believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a reality in his life. Peter and all but one of the apostles died a martyr's death because of their conviction that Jesus was the Son of God. How deep is your conviction that Jesus is real and that he is the Messiah? You know, it was a, it was a great afternoon uh, yesterday. Uh, Kyle Swan and uh, Jared McGee came over to the house and we were counting the cost with uh, Kyle. And I really didn't know Kyle too well, and so I just got to hear his life story. And, and he's, he's pretty excited because he was hoping to get baptized today, which he is. Amen, guys. Amen. But then I said, okay, bro, we need, to, we need to talk about your life. I said, you need to deal with your heart and your sins. Let's, let's talk about it. You know, if there's anything that's humiliating, it's when you have to confess your sins to the Lord and, and to your brother. And, and all of us, you know, when, when, when we're called upon to confess our sin, there, there is a sense of just crud that comes on over us. You know what I'm talking about? The, the reality of sin is even in our consciousness of self. You know, if anyone ever doubted the spiritual world, there's that thing about when you sin, you feel gir- dirty and you feel grungy, don't you? And, you know, as, as Kyle went on, I could just see him getting more and more down because, you know, our, 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 our sins do weigh us down. Our sins do condemn us. I said, but listen, dude, tomorrow you're going to get baptized. And because Jesus resurrected, you're going to resurrect. And the Bible promises that God doesn't even remember your sins. I mean, Kyle just lit right on up right there. How about it? Are you fired up this morning about being saved? See, that's the encouraging message because there's a response to that message. Look what he says right here in verse 36. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. Both Lord and Christ. Peter wanted to drive the bad news on home. Because if you don't understand the bad news, then you can't appreciate the good news of Jesus Christ. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Well, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, in talking to Kyle, not only was he excited about getting all of his sins forgiven, but I said, dude, you know, you also get the Holy Spirit when you're baptized. And that gives you the power to overcome all of those sins that have mastered your life for so long. I don't know about you guys, but that's a great message. Amen? That we're going to change the world by changing individuals. Yet it's up to every individual to respond to this great message. You know, a lot of individuals today get caught up in denominational thinking. And because they haven't spent much time in the book of Acts, fail to see that the New Testament church was not a little group of autonomous little churches scattered all over everywhere. But the New Testament church was a movement. A movement that swept the world in a generation. Let's see if we can grab that from the great numbers that we see. Let's go back to Acts chapter 1. We know that Jesus ascended into heaven. Amen, guys? Right after the Great Commission. And then we read this in verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. A Sabbath they walked from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew. Notice how the apostles are paired up right here, guys. James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up amongst the believers, a group numbering about 120. Now the question has to come, who is this 120? It's an incredible group of people. It's the faithful 11. Amen, guys? And we know that Matthias is added later on in the chapter right there to make the 12 apostles again. But we also find right here that all of Jesus' family is now disciples. Is that exciting? 
Yet his family had opposed him early on, and yet Jesus, because he kept his commitment strong and never compromised it, then his mom and all of his brothers and sisters were disciples. That's awesome. Amen, guys? Then all the women that were with him, and the women were very important to the ministry of Jesus because they're the ones that supported him. Amen. Just a little detail right there. Amen. <laughs> but they're there. That's exciting. Amen. And then, uh, forgotten by most people that Jesus had commissioned not only the 12, but the 72. And that makes up the 120. Now that is a cranking group of disciples. The apostles. The 72. His family. And the women that just gave everything they had to support Jesus. These are people that are totally dedicated. Amen? Well, now Peter preaches that message there on the day of Pentecost. And let's look at the response. Verse 41. Chapter 2. Hello. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Is that a cranky vision of the church or not? Look at what it says right here. On that day, 3,000 people were baptized. But that's not exactly the terminology. It says 3,000 people were added to their number. Well, what were they added to? The 120. And so really we could read this in verse 42. And they devoted themselves. Who's the they? The 3,120 devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The 3,120 devoted themselves to the fellowship. The 3,120 devoted themselves to breaking of bread. And the 3,120 devoted themselves to prayer. There was no distinguishment between the commitment of an apostle and a new baby Christian. They were all sold out disciples. And it was a powerful testimony. Everyone was just in awe of God. That he was affecting so many lives. Look what happens down here, verse 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Is that exciting? Every day they were having baptisms. Just a few months later, chapter 4, verse 4. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. You know, you go into a lot of churches today, and all you see is a bunch of women. Let me tell you something. Christianity was for men and women. Men were called higher by this gallant challenge to change the world. You take away the challenge to change lives and to change the world, you take away the challenge that most people and most men want to be a part of. Let me tell you something. The men right here in the book of Acts, were forceful, dynamic disciples of Jesus Christ that held the same commitment as the apostles unto death were they faithful to Jesus. Chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. I mean, they just lost count now. So many people are becoming Christians. Chapter 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing... That needs to be how it is in these days. Amen? Amen. Verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. You see the sense of movement right here? A spreading. Almost like those fires spreading across the Hollywood hills. There was a spreading. And it says, excitingly right here, the number of disciples increased rapidly. You know, a lot of people say, I just want to build the church really slowly. Well, why do you want to do that? We want as many people as possible to be saved. Amen, guys? And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Let's keep going. Chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, in Samaria. Chapter 9, verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Wow, that's just describing the church. Now, you know, in some churches in the past, we've overused numbers. On the other hand, we we can't just toss numbers out the window because they measure the magnitude of the miracle of God. Are you with me right here? And after all, God even named a book after numbers. Amen? Amen. Most people that don't want to use numbers just don't have them. That's the bottom line. 
Let's go. Chapter 9, verse 42. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. The whole city knew about it. Chapter 11, verse 21. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. You know, some people believed that the church in Antioch grew to 50,000 disciples. When, when the Bible says great numbers, it means what? Great numbers. Amen, guys. That's great. <laughs> Chapter 12, verse 24. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. Do you see the concept of movement right here? It's not, oh, and the word of God continued to build this nice little congregation. No, the word of God continued to increase and spread. Why was the word of God increasing? Because the number of disciples was increasing. Amen? Chapter 13, verse 49. This is talking about Pisidian Antioch, the middle of modern-day Turkey. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. It's just spreading all over. Chapter 14, verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual in the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. Chapter 21, verse 14. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. This is exciting, amen? Chapter 16, verse 5. Look at this one, guys. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Now it wasn't just the Jerusalem church that was growing daily, but all the churches were growing daily. Is that exciting? Why? Because all the churches were multiplying disciples. Let's go to chapter 19, verse 10. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. In two years' time, an area that is now western Turkey, greater than the size of California, had been evangelized. See, the word had gone out. That just, to, to evangelize an area doesn't mean everybody becomes a Christian. To evangelize an area means that everybody has heard. Are you with me right here? Go to chapter 28, the end of the book. Verse 22. The people at Rome are asking Paul this. But we want to hear what your views are. For we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. Against this cult. Everywhere people are talking. Now, when he gets to Rome, Paul is imprisoned. While he's in prison, he writes the book of Colossians. This is about 60 AD, about 30 years after the church had started. Go to the book of Colossians right now and let's see what he writes from prison right there at the end of the book of Acts. Let's pick it up in chapter 1, verse 6. Paul writes, he says, All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all of its truth. Is that awesome, guys? All over the world. But look at verse 23. This is the gospel that you heard, and it has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. By the time Paul's in prison there, at the end of the book of Acts, he could write, every creature under heaven has heard. In 30 years, a generation, all the known world had heard about Jesus Christ. Do you think we can do that again, church? That is our vision. Amen. You know, it was so exciting being over there for the gathering, the European Missions Conference. And, uh, you know, it was our first inaugural service for the London International Christian Church. And they've got 19 fired up, sold out disciples that are incredible, guys. They're an upward call to us all. But what was exciting at the conference was just to see the interest in so many other nations that had come. At the conference, people were from Canada, Estonia, France, Germany, India, Ireland, Poland, Pakistan, South Africa, Sweden, Switzerland, Ukraine, U.S., and of course, England. Amen, guys? I mean, that's incredible! That was incredible! And not only did we have just a cranking first service that Sunday, but on that Sunday we had some disciples come all the way from Paris. And they said, listen, we want to join the new movement. And so this week we have our first Bible talk in Paris, France. Is that awesome? The Word of God is spreading, it's moving, it's increasing, just like it says in the Word of God. Are you with me right here? i got to ask you, if everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? Would the Word of God be spreading and increasing and forcefully advancing 
into all the nations. You have a heart that says, listen, I'm willing to do anything, go anywhere, give up everything for the cause of Christ. Or you're going, hold it, I'm 32 now, I can't do that. See, either you're a sold out disciple or you're not. Not only in building a great church, we need the great commission, a great message with great numbers, but we need to have great boldness. Go to the book of Acts chapter 3. I love this account, guys. Verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he is put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from him. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. Sounds like our college students, right? Silver or gold I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand. Can you picture this, guys? Taking him by the right hand, he helped them up and instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Is that how you came to church this morning, walking and jumping? Is that how fired up you were? So this guy was fired up to go worship God. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, so how do you know that he was praising God? Well, he was jumping. Amen. They recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They couldn't believe the change. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, let me tell you something. He wasn't going to let those guys go. You know, if you're studying the Bible with somebody right now, don't let that guy go. Don't let that girl go. They are your hope. God has sent them into your life to bring you salvation. Like this, like this crippled guy that got healed. Don't let those people go. Amen? All the people were astonished, came running to them in a place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does it surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. I mean, Peter lays it out. Bad news? You killed Jesus. Good news? He resurrected, and you can have life. That's got to be our message. See, so many churches just want to preach fuzzy, wuzzy good news. And they wonder why the people don't change their life. No one can appreciate the good news until they hear the bad news of where they stand with God. We can't be afraid to preach the word. Well, it's exciting. Let's see what happens to the guys. Chapter 4, verse 1. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. That's their message. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. This is the first time the apostles are persecuted and put in prison. But the Bible says the movement continues to force the advance. Well, Peter and John are brought before the most powerful group of men in all of Israel. Remember, Israel's a theocracy. And so that means that their religious leaders are their governing leaders. These are the most brightest minds in all of Israel. And Peter is not shy. Verse 12. He's talking to them. He says, Salvation is found in no one else, but there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. When they saw the boldness, they go, man, I've only seen that with one guy before. That guy, Jesus. 
Oh yeah, Peter and John were with him all the time. He says, but you know, these guys, they're unschooled and ordinary men. You know, I, I, I love Kyle Bartholomew, and Kyle's been doing an awesome job there at Cal State Fullerton. Amen, guys? And several months ago, we're, we're just talking about Bible verses. He says, bro, I got this incredible insight. I said, bro, give it to me. He says, it's from Acts 4.13. I said, well, okay, what is it? He says, well, bro, I was, I was studying the Greek. Kyle, you studying the Greek? He says, yes, bro, I was studying the Greek. And it said that they were unschooled and ordinary men. Now, this is the truth. The word ordinary in Greek is the word idiote, which we get our English word idiot from. And so literally translated... It says that Peter and John, they were considered unschooled idiots that followed Jesus. So there's room for a lot of us to follow Jesus. Amen, guys? Amen. But what's the key? Boldness. Great boldness. Let's keep, keep, keep watching here. Verse 14. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, they had nothing to say. So they ordered them to withdraw from Sanhedrin, and then they conferred together. So they say, Peter and John, you guys got to leave. We got to talk about what to do with you. So they talk, 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 talk. Here's what they come up with. Verse 16. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they've done an outstanding miracle, and we can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further amongst the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Wow. These were the best minds in Israel. They understood something very fundamental. They said, what we need to do to stop Christianity is not to get Peter and John to change their beliefs. It's not to get Peter and John to change their lifestyle or their convictions. It's to get them to shut up. If you can get Christians to shut up, you will stop it from spreading. They got it. They figured out how to stop Christianity. Well, let's see what the guys did. Verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. After further threats, they let them go. They couldn't decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Yeah, even 40-year-olds can change. That's exciting. Even 40-year-olds. Damon, you are fired up. I know you are. So here, they, they, they've been put in prison. They've been confronted by the Sanhedrin. What happens? Verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. Well, who's their own people? It's the disciples. It's the church. Now, you got to remember, there's only one church in all the world right now, the church in Jerusalem. So they're literally going back to all the Christians in the world. And they're having a good news sharing time right here. Verse 24. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles. And the people of Israel in this city conspire against your holy servant Jesus, he anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God. What? Holy. Wow. Is that incredible? To build a great church, there's got to be great boldness. And great boldness comes from praying to God to give you the strength to go out and preach the word of God. Now, you got to admit, it had been pretty cool to been praying for great boldness, and then the earthquake hits right there. You'd be motivated to go on out. Amen, guys? You'd be motivated. You know, it's kind of interesting. They didn't pray, Lord, take away the persecution. Lord, my life is too hard. Lord, they're saying mean things against me. No, they said, listen, Lord, 
We don't care about the persecution. You're sovereign. You know you're going to let it happen. But Lord, just we pray for great boldness. After they prayed for great boldness, then they went out and preached the word of God boldly. Let me ask you again. If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? You know, uh, we got, in coming back home, it's always... But if you travel a lot as a, 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 maybe a salesman or whatever, you know if you're away for a few days, sometimes bad news awaits you when you get home. So my prayer every time is, Lord, let good news await me. <laughs> Particularly on the internet. You know, all the emails, you know how they stack up? I got one of the most encouraging emails. On, it was from our brother Raul Mourinho. Oh, yeah. And Raul, of course, is, is leading our sister church down in Santiago, Chile. It's cranking. Well, he had flown all the way up to Central America to San Pedro Sula, Honduras for their first anniversary service. Now, the church there doesn't have a full-time person yet. But they started one year ago with 50 sold-out disciples. Now they have 75 sold-out disciples. And the exciting thing is that this, their first anniversary service, they had 500 people in attendance. 317 were non-Christians. And they passed cards out, and 240 of them want to study the Bible. Is that awesome? Now get this, get this. Ra- Raul is just blown away. He's going, wow, this is incredible. And he's talking to the church leaders, and both uh, the church leader, uh, Dorian and Rosa, work. And he says, wow, this was incredible. He said, did you guys have any visitors today? He said, well, we counted up. We had 27 visitors. He goes, well, how'd you do that? And they just kind of said, well, it's just prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. How did the Christians have such a great impact in the first century? Prayer and fasting. Great boldness. If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? Let's read on. Chapter 4, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. So that's what persecution does for you too. Gets you unified. Gets you unified in the Lord. Gets you unified with one another. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And much grace was upon them all. There was no needy persons amongst them. From time to time, those who owned land or, sold, or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. If we're going to build a great church, it's going to take great power and great sacrifice. Amen? You know, right here, I mean, the sacrifice was amazing. The Bible says there was no needy person amongst them. And the sacrifices were so gigantic, people who owned lands or homes sold them and gave the money for the apostles to distribute as they thought best. In particular, there was this guy, Joseph, who must have given an unbelievable amount of money Because he got a nickname when he gave the money. Barnabas, Barna means son of. So it means, Barnabas means encouragement. So they gave him the nickname son of encouragement. Barnabas, or we just call him Barney. (laughs) Barney. It's just Barney, man. He cranked. Man, he sacrificed just all this land. And it's, it's helped meet the needs of the disciples so much. You know, I remember back in the mid-80s when Elaine and I were in the church in Boston. And uh, one of the elders came forward and he found this article in the Mainline Church of Christ paper. And the article commended this one church. They raised over a million dollars for a new building. But the article said, it goes on, it says, this is commendable. This church had raised over a million dollars for a new building. He says, but where is the congregation? that someday is going to raise a million dollars for missions and missions only. And we set that before the church that year. And the church sacrificed and sacrificed. I mean, it was amazing. I remember one sister named Lynn sold her prize horse from her youth. I remember myself, I, I gave up my prize coin collection. And I, I shared about it. And I had this one brother come on up and say, bro, I got a bad attitude. I said, well, why do you got a bad attitude? He says, well, you shared about giving up your coin collection. And he says, just 
I don't want to put you down or anything, but your coin collection doesn't compare to mine. Now I've got to give mine all up. <laughs> I remember Elena gave up the diamond in her engagement ring. And even to this day, she's got a fake diamond there. Of course, sometimes it's kind of funny going to somebody that cleans it. They go, Elena, do you know this is not real? You know, <laughs> that husband of yours. But there was one family in the church that sold their house and gave it, the profit of it, to the church. We had a goal of a million dollars, we blew it out. You know, right now, church, we've got a great challenge. We're in economic suppressed time here. And yet we're going to have to ask ourselves, how much do we believe in what we're doing here? On November 18th, we have our Thanksgiving missions contribution to become self-supporting here. We're asking 10 times from each person. But the issue right here is, are we really going to have the spirit of the New Testament Christians that are willing to sacrifice those things that are most precious in order to see God's kingdom forcefully advance? How much do you believe in what God is doing in your life and the hope that it's giving to those around you? To build a great church, it's going to take great financial sacrifice. Yeah, that's right. Let's keep reading chapter 5. And this continues the idea of selling fields and giving it. Verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Well, let's think this out. It would have been quite fine if Ananias would have just sold the property and said, hey, I'm only giving part of this to the church. But he acted like he was giving all of it to the church, but he held back some for himself with his wife's full knowledge. Amen? Let's see what happens. Verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what happened. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Peter asked her, uh, Tell me, please, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in, finding you dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. To build a great church, there's got to be a great fear. A great fear of God. You know, Jesus confronts the church in the book of Revelations, in Revelations 2.20. He's talking to the church of Thyatira. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who teaches about immorality. Now, we got to deal with immorality in the church, amen? amen? And Jesus would have us deal with immorality. But that wasn't what he was confronting the church there with. He was confronting the church with tolerating immorality, tolerating sin. The church, by the end of the first century, had lost their fear of God and the consequences of sin. I've got to ask you a question. I mean, do you fear God? You know, we live in an age where everybody wants to talk about just grace, 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 grace. Let me tell you something. There is the discipline of God. So how do you know it? Because I felt it. I felt it. It's not pleasant. But if you don't get a bad attitude towards it, it can yield a harvest of righteousness. But we have to have a fear. If we've got sin in our lives, it's got to come out. I mean, it was so awesome just seeing Kyle come in this morning because he, he had to confess his sin to one particular individual. And uh, he had to get right with that person. And when he came in this morning, he just had the biggest grin. Because when you confess your sin and you get it out there in the open then you know the Lord is going to forgive it. Are you with me right here, guys? But we've got to have a conviction to have great fear. Not only in our own life, but we've got to be our brother's keeper. You know, it's not, church is not a matter of coming together, having a good time, talking about the latest sports teams and what's going on in the market or something like this. 
When we have fellowship in our church, it's, it's about talking, bro, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. No, bro, how you really doing? We, we need to be involved in each other's lives. I mean, it's great. The curses have been working hard with the finances and everything and put on a really neat breakfast and presentation. And then Michael asked just to, you know, just to share uh, some things on his heart with Elena and me. And, and I said, well, bro, please do that. And he, he just laid it on. And I said, bro, please just be totally open. And he was. And, you know, when, and, and when you're totally open, I mean, you, then you can have an awesome relationship. But one of the great challenges in this day and age is that we're fearful that people aren't going to love us. That, that doesn't matter. The issue is God. You've got to be open. You've got to be transparent in order to get the kind of help that you need in order to be the best disciple you can be for Jesus Christ. Amen? And then, when we're open with our brothers and sisters, prayerfully we'll have a great spirit of mercy and grace, just like our Father in heaven. Amen, church? Well, if we continue on here, in chapter 5, we see that something that's essential in building a great church is great leadership. We find now all the apostles are out there preaching the word of God. They get arrested, an angel frees them, and then they get rearrested. And they come before the Sanhedrin. They don't really know what to do with them, but we pick it up right here in verse 33 of chapter 5 of the book of Acts. When they heard this, they were furious, this is Sanhedrin, and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed them, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutius appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all of his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and after, all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, Leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Wow, is that challenging? Now look at this. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let him go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Now that is great leadership. Are you with me right here? These guys were at the forefront. They're at the forefront of preaching and teaching and laying down their lives. When the authority says, don't speak anymore, they says, listen, we got to obey God, not men. Yeah. How about it, guys? How bold are you at work? Come on. How bold are you in the college classroom? How bold are you at the high school? How bold are you in the neighborhood? Are you like the apostles? Day after day, and from house to house, they never stop preaching and teaching and proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the lifestyle. Yeah. That's what the New Testament church looks like. Got to ask that question. If everybody were like me, what kind of church would this be? You know, it's very interesting. We find in the next chapter right here, there's a problem in the church. Let's look. In verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Point one right here. There is no perfect church. As awesome as Jerusalem was, they had problems. There were people being overlooked. Why? It was growing so fast. Now, they do something about it. Verse 2. So 12 gathered all the disciples together and asked, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God, nor to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you, who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Right here is how you build a great church. The leadership needs to be focused on prayer and the ministry of the word. Taking care of the needs, as we talked about earlier in our service. In the CR ministry, we are so thankful for Omar and Selena stepping up to really help people there. Amen, guys? We're so helpful for people like Yelena and Michael helping with the finances. That's, that's, that's so important. We're, we're, we're thankful for Adolfo and Carolyn dealing with the lost and found. Because if, if, 
The people that were trying to leave the church were looking around all the time for your Bible or your pencil that you lost. Somehow I just don't think the fellowship would be quite what it needs to be. You know what I'm talking about? And besides, I'm not as good with the numbers as Michael anyway. And so we've got to understand that, that in the church, we need to accept that the, the ministry people got to be focused on prayer and the ministry. It's not that they're too good to set up tables or chairs or serve food, but they've got to stay focused. Secondly, we've got to have brothers and sisters say, look, here am I, send me, I, I'll help out here, I'll serve here, I'll do this. You know, one of the great needs we have now in the church is kids' kingdom. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I just want to be in the auditorium and I have visitors that come. And, and we forget that, hey, those kids in there, they're non-Christians to be. It just takes about 12, 13 years to baptize them, eh, hey guys? And we need to understand, guys, that's an area we desperately need people that want to have the heart to serve. That want to have the heart to serve. And if we're going to build a great church, you just can't get baptized or get restored to place of membership. Okay, now I'm a member of the City of Angels Church. I can just sit back and enjoy the wonderful singing and fellowship. No, it's time to roll up your sleeves and to get going. It's time to get moving. Find a place to serve. Find a place to help. Start helping those around you. Are you with me right here? That is great leadership. Well, what happens after they implemented this? Verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Well, when they had the problem, the church was still growing. But once they delegated out responsibility and the ministry staff was focused on prayer to minister the word, now the word of God was growing rapidly. Amen, guys? Well, you know, it's exciting. One of the men that was selected to serve the tables was a guy named Stephen. And he started out by serving, but the Lord raises him up to become one of the greatest preachers in the first century. And he quickly catches the attention of the whole city. So much so, he's arrested, and he's brought in front of the whole Sanhedrin. And you talk about a cranking sermon. All of chapter 7 in the book of Acts is Stephen's sermon to the Sanhedrin. Let's just pick up the end of it right here in verse 51. <clears throat> you can see why he was such a popular preacher right here at the beginning in verse 51. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. This is his closing. This is, the, this is like, you know, when you close a sermon, you're supposed to be really inspirational. This is, this is, this is the, the crescendo right here. This is the real inspirational part right here. You're just like your father's. You always resist the Holy Spirit. I bet they were feeling good, weren't they? Was there ever a prophet your fathers didn't persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you betrayed and murdered him. You who received the law that was put into effect through the angels but not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth. I mean, this is the intellectual elite of Israel. They hear this message. They are furious. They're gnashing their teeth. What's that? That's just going. <laughs> That's what you do when your wife asks you to empty the trash. Verse 55. So they're, they're furious. They're gnashing their teeth. Now look at this, guys. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, yelled at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. If you're going to build a great church, there's going to be great persecution. There's going to be great persecution. Right here, I mean, you, you got a picture. Here's this young preacher just laying it out in front of the Sanhedrin. They're furious. They're gnashing their teeth. And all of a sudden, something gives them the urge to look up. And he looks up and the clouds part, and he sees Jesus. Now, you know, these people are already ticked off. He's talking about Jesus. He goes, hey, now I see him. I see Jesus. <laughs> and 
and he's standing at the right hand of God. Now that's important for all of us in his praise report. In all the other scriptures about Jesus, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Right here is standing, I believe, in salute to the first Christian martyr to be. He's not seeing Jesus standing right here. At this, they just rush him. They take him outside the city. They start stoning him. Look at his heart, guys. Look at this. Watch. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Who's that sound like? Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Who's that sound like? But we don't know if Stephen had much contact with Jesus. But we know that the apostles, they had contact with discipling with Jesus. And we know that Stephen had discipling from the apostles. See, that's what discipleship does. It's passing on the heart of Jesus into someone else. You know, if you have a difficult time, you're trying to think about, what do we talk about in our discipleship partner time? Well, it's very simple. You just say, okay, here's the person you're trying to disciple, and here's Jesus, you know, from the scriptures. Okay, what's the difference? Okay, that's what you talk about. <laughs> For a lot of us, that gives you a lot to talk about. Yeah. But we've got to really ask yourself, is, is that what we're trying to do in our discipling relationships? Do we want someone to really help us be like Jesus? Do we have the heart of Stephen that's willing to lay down his life? You know, a lot of us go, yeah, that's first century stuff. <clears throat> it was interesting. We went to London. I got off the airplane. All the disciples were greeting. And it's always great to be greeted by disciples, isn't it? They're all there. They're going crazy. And, uh, you know, they're all hugging and they're happy. And, you know, you don't know how your breath is or how you, you stink from being on the airplane 40 hours, you know. And, but it's great. Disciples love you anyway, right? And uh, Tim goes, bro, I need to talk to you. Tim Kernan, you know who leads the church over there? I said, well, okay, okay is there anything big? He says, I, I, I need to do it privately. He says, it's, it's, it's bad news. Now, I don't like that when people tell me that. I said, well, how bad? He said, bro, I need, to, I need to talk to you way over here. Is that bad? He says, is that bad? He said, bro, it's been a very serious death threat against me, Leanne, and you. I said, well, how serious? He says, I asked the police that. He says, a place has been named, a time has been set, and a price, $4,000. Is that all? <laughs> that is bad news. <laughs> so, he says, he says, bro, it's very serious. Well, it's kind of neat. You know, you, later on in the book of Acts, we find that Paul gets escorted by 200 soldiers. Safety when there's a death plot against him. During our whole time at the conference, we had all these bobbies. Well, that's what they call London policemen. All around us, we had, we had these bobbies all the time. We had plain close places, and they had to sit in the services as well. <laughs> at the end of the first night, Tim goes, hey, and all you visiting policemen, all the visiting bobbies right here, I hope you'll respond to the message as well. But you know, God takes care of us, doesn't he? Yeah. But we need to understand that what people want to do is they want to destroy the messenger thinking that they'll destroy the message. And you need to understand that you are the hope of a lost world. And we are very serious about this. When we say Jesus is Lord, when we see the four get baptized today, they're saying Jesus is Lord. And I will be faithful unto death. How about it? If the church, if everyone in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? What if the whole church had everybody sold out to the point they're willing to die for Jesus? That's what the first century church was about. Let's close out here. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and more deeply formed, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them into prison. Why house to house? Because that's how they met in house churches. Verse 4. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So the apostles stayed in Jerusalem because they were commanded to. But all the other Christians, man, we're going to get out of here in the new territory. This was not a fearful flight, but a joyful flight. Joyful leaving. Going, wow, we're going to new people. And the Bible says they scattered and they preached the word wherever they went. Is that exciting? Amen, guys? Philip.
Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowd who Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. The last mark of building a great church is a church that has great joy. Amen. You know, you can, you can catch it in the singing. Yeah. Yeah. You can catch it in the buzz and the fellowship. You can, of course, see it in people's faces. Yeah. Why was the joy in the first century church? Because of the miracles. You know, we believe that everybody that's baptized is a miracle. Yeah. You know, have you ever heard somebody share their conversion story and go, eh, that, was a, that was a boring one? <laughs> You know, no one has a boring conversion story. They're all cranking. I go, no, you did that. Yeah, yeah, I did, but I've changed. <laughs> he met you there. Yeah, yeah, but I still became a Christian. Well, that's good. Amen. <clears throat> you know, it was, it's really been awesome. Next Sunday will mark our sixth month anniversary in starting the church. Do you believe it? We started the first Sunday in May, and in less than six months, we came with 42 sold-out disciples from Portland. In, in just less than six months, we've seen 41 people baptized into Christ. Now that's multiplication, amen, guys? Now get this. 38 people have been restored. These are followers that come back to the Lord. And 56 people have placed membership with us, and we love you too, Amen. amen. But guys, I mean, stories like this haven't been heard for years. I was over in London. I got pulled aside by one of the brothers that was visiting from continental Europe. He says, bro, when you go back to the City of Angels Church, he says, can you please tell them that we are so thankful for their example of faith and love? He says, as far as I know, what's happening there isn't happening anyplace else. He says, please let them know that we just live up for the stories that we read on Upside Down 21 and the City of Angels website. You know, guys, you know, what can sometimes happen when, when you're in the midst of awesome things is we can take our eyes off God and look at each other and see all of each other's shortcomings and not appreciate the miracles that surround us. You know, I really hope and pray that today you appreciate that God is moving amongst us. Amen. That you appreciate when the four people stand up here and say, Jesus, Lord, you're watching four modern-day miracles. Amen. Changes in the eternal destiny of people's lives. Yeah. And as you go back over these scriptures, there's just one question I want you to ask. If everyone was like me, what kind of church would this be? Thank you, and God bless you.